Hi, I'm Stephanie Bass. And I'm Donald. And you're in mixed company. Welcome to In Mixed Company. This is a podcast discussing mixed race identity and the politics of race comfortably in mixed racial company. Today on the podcast, multiracial myths. There are a lot of them. Doesn't it sound like a Greek mythology sort of thing? Yeah, only less about religion and more about sucking. Okay. <laughs> More about crap. Yeah, more about making people feel bad. Um, so I had recorded a podcast with my sister the other day on raising biracial children. And I thought it would be good before that if we could release something about, you know, the myths of being biracial or multiracial. Because there's kind of a lot. Because I know that when people find out that I am of mixed racial makeup, I guess, it, I get a lot of really strange questions. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought it would be good to sort of just lay those out on the table and say, don't, don't, don't ask those. Don't do that. Yeah, or better yet, I mean, there's, number one, there's a way to be educated about it. You can, you can sort of educate yourself by being exposed to sort that of would be of, That would be the first thing you should probably try to do. Yeah. And then the other thing is, is that if you do have questions, there's ways of asking things respectfully where you're not like you know making someone feel terrible about themselves yeah well i don't feel terrible about myself when people ask me certain things but what i do feel is like i maybe look down on them a little bit i'm like really yeah you can't figure this out on your own well there's probably a, a little bit of willful ignorance do you think it's that significant like yeah i just come up with counter questions which i don't know um so i i guess we'll get into it um like always i mean i was a history major Yay. so i'm gonna start a little bit with the history of mixed race people um we're more visible now so sometimes people are like oh how do you feel now that you're not like the only mixed race person mm -hmm. and i've never been the only mixed race person um i just think that because it's not illegal and not as taboo anymore that you will see more mixed race people walking around, right? But Absolutely, but at the same time Like I read though, the like I was reading the Trevor Noah biography <clears throat> and um he like he wasn't really allowed to go out a lot and stuff because people would say that he like he knew that he was a a product of like an illegal union between his parents, right? So he, yeah, right there. <laughs> so that he, um, he knew that he couldn't be uh, seen in public so much. And so, um, in the past, mixed race children were there. Um, They've always been there. Yeah, and so so, in the past, mixing races was a, a crime in. Canada and the United States. Yeah. Um, it was a crime even more recently in places like South Africa, like apartheid South Africa. Um, because people had all sorts of theories about what would happen if people of different races had children. So there was a French anthropologist in the 1860s, and I can't remember his name, but he said that mixed race, mixed race people like mules, would be sterile and miserable forever. Not based on biology. No. Or any kind of science. It's just his own philosophy. Well, and there's a problem, right? Because he's likening um, them to the offspring of a mule, right? Like, mm -hmm. that they're, like, that they would be part animal, and that would make them sterile, right? Yeah. So... Um, and then we get into eugenics, which is aw an awful uh, part of, of social history. Charles Davenport, who was a, a really um, popular uh, eugenicist, he said that multiracial people would suffer from emotional and mental problems. So it was a bad idea for the races to mix, quote unquote. Yeah, I feel like all of these people were white. 
Of course they were. Yeah. <laughs> and we'll talk later about um, sort of black people and how historically they had an input on mixed race children. It, it wasn't that positive either. Mm. Um, in the 1980s, um, multiracialism was sort of pathologized be, um, psycho- like psychologically because uh, the idea is that um, multiracial people would be confused and anxious and poorly adjusted as to not belonging to either racial group. Um, and I have a, a couple of other pieces of history, like in 1930 in Ontario, how the Ku Klux Klan was very active in bothering people who had mixed race children or when were in mixed race relationships. So um, I can put that on the blog. Um, but I think the point is that the myths that we're going to talk about developed historically because of a lot of the input of these people who were considered experts in their time, right? Right. So um, we'll talk about some of those myths together and then we'll make some explanations as to why they are baloney. Yeah, I mean, ultimately... But that's not what I really wanted to say. Well, this is a (laughs) family-friendly podcast, after all. Um, I just... I struggle with it because, like, we were kids in the 80s. Yeah. And when you were talking about how multiracialism was pathological, pathologized you pathologized oh pathologized thank you good <laughs> lord i can't talk um to me that's more like it's it's weird because while they're pathologizing a human being a person what they're actually saying is that person is going to feel that way what they're not addressing is the fact that society is yeah. what's causing it yeah right they're like no it's your fault it's your problem when in reality it's all the external stuff that's hitting people of course so um how do you want to do this you want to just well i mean you've kind of gone through the first bit so do you want me to sort of pick it up sure do let's do the first you do the first myth uh so the first myth that we're going to talk about today is that multiracial people can only identify as one race and sometimes we do like I've talked about this before I don't know if I've talked about it on the podcast yet but that my racial identity if somebody asks me as I just usually say I'm black um and that's I'm very light-skinned so that's clearly not true that I'm only black but um when I was growing up that's what I was told I was mm-hmm. do you know what I mean and yeah. so my identity sort of have developed because my family was black and that's what I was told that I was. And so I walk through the world like, and if somebody asks me, I'm like, Oh, well I'm black. Like, yeah. Well, we've also, I know that you've mentioned on the podcast before uh, a couple of things about, um, like, uh, what was it called? Like race court where people were, <laughs> yeah. people were like, you know, I'd watch are that you, on TV. are you Asian? Are you, are, you know, <laughs> the race court. Yeah. The race court. Whatever yeah, that was. What you're allowed to do based on the sort of m- racial makeup. Yeah. Of your multiracialism. So, but the idea of placing me sort of in the black side party of my identity comes from um, the legal precedent of the one drop rule, which is actually people think that this was a slavery sort of invention. And it actually didn't come up until um, the 20th century. The idea of having one drop, quote unquote, of black blood. Yeah, in your ancestry made you a black person, right? That was well. That was also the time when eugenics were really becoming yeah. mainstream and big. Yeah, and so everybody suddenly, and also you know there were there were concerns that black people were were getting you know too much, too many rights. Yeah, and so it was created for the idea of white racial purity, and yeah. the first law I think that was documented in the states anyways was in Tennessee in 1910 um and it's it's kind of interesting because that isn't how race works it's not a question of blood mixing yeah right so I always find that very 
interesting how the laws had been <coughs> created w- without actually understanding sort of the science behind it. They're very socialized laws, right? Well, and I mean, we, we see the same kind of thing now when we see laws that are based on these these sort of outmoded or outdated ideas Mm -hmm. that have nothing to do with science and have nothing to do with research. And they're all just feeling based reactions to change that people don't like. And I think that's what those were. Yeah. And so, and the reason why the one drop law was really important um, was for the idea of the social segregation of people, white people and people of color, right? So, if you had some black ancestry, well, then obviously you use the resources that were there for black people. You don't use the white people resources. And that was something that happened in Canada as well. Because mm-hmm. if you look at some of our history, like um, the story of uh, what was her name, Viola Desmond, mm-hmm. who was um, a woman who refused to leave the white part of a theater. I mean, we still had that segregation um mentality in Canada as well. So that one drop rule was something that um, did affect us north of the border as well. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it also like boiled, like, because these things develop over decades and centuries. Not centuries. Decades. See, the one drop thing was a 20th century invention, and we're not that far into the 21st century. So it's... 1910 to 2018, that's one... One century. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> you're like centuries. That's Century. That's true. But like, like the bulldozing of Africville in, in in Halifax, right? Yeah. Where you know uh, that w- that took place in what the 50s or 60s? Yeah, I think the 60s. You know, and that was that was a a, a, a black community. Mm-hmm. They weren't allowed to live anywhere else, and they just bulldozed it into the ground so they could build houses. But if you think about it, I, I don't know. I would mm. be really interested to do a little more research on that if there were mixed race families that were living there Hmm. you know i think that that would be that would be a story that needs to be told so i don't know now Mm -hmm. great now i have more research thanks for that oh you're welcome (laughs) the second myth i wasn't sure i was going to include this okay because when i was talking um with my sister Mm -hmm. she was like that's stupid (laughs) like she didn't think it was a real thing and I didn't explain it very well. Hmm. I explained it so poorly I had to go back to my thesis and look at it. Yeah. Um, but the second myth that we're looking at has historically been called the quote-unquote tragic mulatto, which is very gendered because mm-hmm. that has to do mostly with women. But what I like to call it is the confused racial identity myth. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'll give you a little bit of history. Um the quote-unquote tragic mulatto. And mulatto is a word we don't use to describe multiracial people anymore. It literally means mule. Yeah. And it was used as sort of a striation of um, shadism uh, against slaves, right? Because yeah, it's, the it's lighter a, you were, the more money yeah. you were worth. And Yeah, and, and it, it goes further and further and further, and they're all offensive yeah. words. Yeah, so um, the myth, this myth is based on a literary trope. Okay, we have we have film tropes now. Before films, there were literary tropes, and this trope suggests that biracial kids, so black and white kids, um, will grow into tortured, angry misfits because they don't fit into black society or white society, um, which is ironic because there was the one drop rule, right? Mm-hmm. So, according to the rules that were in play. They would just be part of black society. One thing people have never been good at, is, or good at, I should say, is following their own rules. Mm-hmm. Um, so just as you have these racial purity laws that we were just talking about, mm-hmm. we also have multiracial children at the same time. It doesn't matter what kind of law you put in place. People are people. Mm-hmm. You know, they're going to love who they love. Are they? Will they? Well, they should. I are hope. you trying to tell me something? <laughs> Telling you I love you. Aww. Aww. There are people listening, I hope. So. And now we're embarrassed. I'm embarrassed. Yeah, I'm not embarrassed. All You're right. Awesome. All right. <clears throat> um, so this trope um, goes back to like the 19th century. And um, 
there's two stories that are sort of credited with the beginning of this trope, and that is the quadroons and slavery's pleasant homes. <laughs> Those don't sound like books I want to read, but mm. I don't know. Um, the negative part of this, which there's a lot, um, is that it, it perpetuates the idea that race mixing is harmful to kids. Yeah. Um, and it's just straight up victim blaming. So, uh, and it goes to what you were saying before, right? Like it's, the confusion wouldn't come from being mixed race. The confusion would come from having to walk in a society, in a world that is divided into two parts, right? And that would be sort of the problem. So putting it all on the idea that it's the person of mixed race, that it's their fault is... Well, it, it's it's a justification of not changing anything. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Um, that too. On the other hand, uh, there have been um, really famous writers, like one of my favorite poets is Langston Hughes, and he had written a poem about a mixed race child in 1926, uh, and the poem's called Cross. And the poem, the poem says very quite honestly that you know dad was white mom was black you know dad died in a big house mom died in a shack i didn't mean for that to rhyme he didn't write a limerick like it's Mm -hmm. a beautiful poem um and so the speaker is wondering where he will be where he will be when he dies right because he's not white nor black right yeah um which on sort of if you look at it simply, it looks like the speaker is confused. But I think that if you look at it on a bigger scale, it really is sort of an indictment of the division. Yeah. Right? Especially housing divisions, if you think about the 1920s and Langston Hughes and the um, Black Renaissance and the emergence of Harlem, right? Yeah. So you have these great northern cities like New York City, and it's still segregated. Yeah. Um, not by law necessarily, but just by the fact of that's where affordable housing was for black people. Yeah. And that's where they lived. And so I think it really gets at the irony, right? Mm-hmm. Of uh, you're a black person, but you're not a black person. Yeah. Um, well, I think the other point of the poem, too, is he starts out hating both his parents, but then he he wishes them well. Mm -hmm. you know so in other words at first he's sort of cursing them but then he's like no i actually hope that you're both kind of in heaven so to speak because Mm -hmm. you know i think that as as a youth being you know being in that space and being mistreated of course you're going to have anger but as you go well and not understanding why the world is the way it is right yeah exactly and 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 then also being forced to stick to one place when you don't fit in that place. Well, I think that you do fit. You just fit in both places, right? Like, you feel that you would fit in both places, but society... Refuses. Yeah, has has stopped with that. Um, so that poem, I'll put it on the blog, because I think it's really worth a read. Mm-hmm. Um, but I didn't want to take up too much time reading it here. Okay. Uh, myth number three. Multiracial people are novelties. <laughs> so that is just statistically not true. Um, according so explain the like the idea is that like um, when I was younger, I was the only sort of mixed race person in my school, right? right. Um, and even that, even though that might be the case today for some mixed race children, like my nieces are the only mixed race people in their school right now, right? Um, our numbers are higher than you think. And, I mean, it's the difference between visible and invisible. Yeah. Right? I I'm mean, very light-skinned, and I I look like I'm of mixed race. Like, I look like I'm yeah. between two races. But some people may not. Some people may look white. Yeah. Right? So how, you know, and some people may look like my brother looks like a black guy. Yeah. Like, <laughs> he does. Yep. Barack Obama looked like a black guy. But they were multiracial, so um, the idea that we're not everywhere 
that were some sort of novelty, I guess, was the only word I could think of. Yeah. So, so. according to the 2006 census... In Canada. In Canada, we're talking. Uh, 7.1% of people in the greater Toronto area... Uh, or Sorry, 7.1% of uh, greater Toronto area marriages were interracial. Yeah. Um, and by 2020... Uh, Statistics Canada predicts that uh, roughly 63% of people living in Toronto will belong in some way to a racialized minority. Which is a term I hate, but the term that we use right now yeah. um, for people who are not white, right? And if you think about it, 63% is more than half, right? Yeah. So is minority going to be the right term? Uh, oh, your mind is blown. <laughs> I was going to say as as long as white people are in charge. Oh, sad. Yeah, because that seems to be that seems to be where it comes. You're from. bumming me out now. Go to the next point. Sorry. More than uh, half of second generation uh, visible minority immigrants who are married uh, have partners outside their race, uh, and by the third generation, it turns to sixty nine percent. Again, this is in the sort of Toronto area in Canada, so in Ontario. Um, and in the American, um, sort of perspective, uh, race mixing is pretty apparent. And I have talked about this with friends that if you have been descended from slaves, like my family has, chances are there's tons of race mixing in your history because there's documented, um, like there's documented events of assault on slave women and you know race mixing relationships so i mean so henry lewis gates jr um had a series on pbs called african american lives which is great mm-hmm. i'm going to try to find a video to put on the blog and so he had a bunch of dna specialists that did some that analyzed something i can't remember it the science nonsense they talked about. The science magic. You're a historian. <laughs> <laughs> I know I know about science, but I'm not like a DNA genetic specialist. So, And what they found was 58% of African Americans have at least 12.5% of European ancestry. So that's the equivalent, they said, to like one great grandparent. So even people that are like, I'm just black. Maybe not, mm-hmm. is what these people are saying um 19.6 percent of african americans have 25 percent mm-hmm. european ancestry which is one grandparent and one percent of african americans have at least 50 percent ancestry um and lewis gates was one of these people because he had 51 percent um european ancestry um and then they went further in that 5% of African Americans have at least 12.5% of what they call Native American, what I'm going to call Indigenous ancestry, um, which isn't weird, right? Because, like, I have Indigenous ancestry yep. that we found out um, because the Indigenous were really uh, important in helping runaway slaves and fighting certain wars against people that had slaves. And so it would make sense that those relationships would happen, right? Yeah. Um, so I I found that really, really interesting. I think there are lots of people breaking those racial purity yeah. laws. I mean, it also goes the other way, too, because, like, if, you, if you've read the news, there were a couple of articles about um, white supremacists having... Genetic tests. Oh yeah, done. that's hilarious. And they were finding that they were. Like, I saw my blood of twenty three and me, and he said, "Oh, this is crap. It's not true." Yeah. So there's quite a few people who identify as white who look white who have no idea. Yeah. That their their that their history has, you know, a, a black great grandparent or something. Somebody of a race that's not white, right? Like yeah. it doesn't always have to be black. Well, yeah, I, I, yeah. I was just, <coughs> excuse me. That's just what we're talking about right mm-hmm. now. So, um, so yeah, and and that's just fascinating. Yeah, I don't. I, don't, I just think it's obvious. Like, duh. But uh, next myth: multiracial people are raceless. Yeah, I don't even have race. So, in other words, despite being part of two racial divisions, 
you don't belong to either of them. I have heard the not black enough comment. Here's story time. You ready? Uh, yeah, go ahead. I um, was a bit of a nerd when I was a kid. And I'm not a nerd anymore. And um, I was going to get this scholarship for black students. And I remember being at the event because they had a huge dinner. And I was standing around. I was alone, which is, that's a story for another episode. But I was alone and two of the other recipients were talking and they were questioning my validity uh, to have this scholarship because I wasn't quote unquote black enough. Mm -hmm. It should have gone to somebody blacker. Yeah. And uh, I was devastated. I was so upset um, because I... I had been called the N word and I had grown up in black neighborhoods with black family and um, people who I identified with didn't think I was quote unquote black enough. Right. Um, and I understand that there's some, like I do have some privilege of having a light skin and there's, there's a whole idea about shadism, which I would love to look into differently. Uh, look into another episode that there can be some resentment between lighter skinned black people and darker skinned black people but I was I was very upset um, and that just sort of fed into this stereotype that I wasn't white enough but I wasn't black enough right so yeah, like yeah. I would say to somebody they'd be like oh what are you and I'd be like well I'm black and they'd be like but you're white too and or if I would say, well, I'm white, they'd be like, well, you're black, too. Like, yeah, exactly. So it was always like people shoving different sort of identities on me. And again, that's, you know, that's always the broader society pushing mm -hmm. its expectation onto a person that doesn't deserve it. Yeah. Because person is a person. doesn't matter, you know, the background. What matters is... Are, are they a decent human being? Well, yeah. But it's always, we are, we are always looking for these subdivisions based on some form of prejudice, whether it's the way you look, whether it's the way you, you know, speak, whether it's the religion you have, whatever it is, there's always these divisions. And the, the one that's been sort of the most codified legally is race. Mm -hmm. So that's always going to be sort of the, the, the worst one. Um, simply because there's such a history and there's, there, there, there's such a systemic aspect to it. Yeah. But I mean, ultimately, you know, we were talking about this earlier, you know, the science, racial differences, it's like the difference between having a mole or not. Yeah. Like in terms like of... Like I've said this before. I'm yeah. like, I'm like a giant freckle. Yeah. There's, there's no, there's no greater difference. But you wouldn't call somebody with freckles necessarily multiracial. <laughs> Don't roll your eyes at me. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to think of something to say, but I couldn't. Um, next myth. People who identify as mixed race uh, are ignoring their heritage. Ugh, so annoying. Just because something's complicated yeah. doesn't mean that you're ignoring something. And the best example I have of this is, remember when Tiger Woods, before he was a big skeezy creep, um, was being interviewed all the time and people would ask him because he's of mixed race. And he would call himself Cablasian. <laughs> I think he did that in an Oprah interview. Yeah, it was pretty funny. And then Colin, Powell, Colin Powell um, had said that, you know, if you look like me, then you're black. Yeah. Right? And that's sort of, again, that, that narrative of people pushing a racial identity on you if you're a mixed race, right? Be based on what you look like. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there's some validity to that because he walks through the world and he looks like a black guy. And so he's going to be treated like a black guy. Right. Um, but at the same time, um, he was trying to honor that he is racially made up of a bunch of things. Right. So, yeah, I, I, I understand his struggle with that interview, but then I don't understand the rest of his life where he's a skeezy creep. Well, I remember that there was quite a bit of sort of discussion around his multiracial identity mm -hmm. because a lot of the white commentators just could not 
like agree that he was entitled to those different aspects of himself. Yeah. They were constantly saying, oh, no, he's black. Or, yeah. Oh, no, he's, you know, he's black and Asian. Or, well, and it sucks because white people would say that about him, but also so would black people, right? And that yeah. sort of feeds that myth of racelessness, right? Yeah. So um, the last one we're going to talk about is that race mixing will end racism. And I think the bottom line for that, and in very short, people will fight over artificial divisions all the time. Yeah. Religion, politics, or origin, age, gender. Um, so hoping for the best just based on who people are sleeping with, I think, is kind of artificial. Yeah. And simple. Yeah, the future is not a utopia that just works out okay. Without, just brown people. Without effort, <laughs> you know. So, I mean, it, so whereas I do tell my little biracial and multiracial students that we are superhuman, um, <laughs> it's not going to end racism, right? Like, it's... Yeah, it's something people are going to have to deal with forever. Like, people have been... Like, there have been mixed-race people all oh, back into slavery, right? And it just... Yeah. That didn't end slavery. They're like, oh, these people are yeah. half and half, so... I think... Uh, again, which is a thing you should not call mixed-race people. Yeah. <laughs> Do not call them half and halves. So if, if racism is not something that we can eradicate, at least it's something that we hopefully be able to push to the margins. Well, I think, I think what multiracial people do is show just how stupid and how ridiculous the sort of racist system is. It's so dichotomous and silly. Yeah. And if we really looked at everybody under a microscope, nobody mm -hmm. would fit into it. Yeah. That it's, um, I think that that is one thing it's, it sort of sheds a light on, right? Um, That's a really good point, actually. But I don't think it's going to end racism. That's that's a pipe dream. We need to talk and do some real work to end racism. Yeah. So. Which is I, why. <laughs> Sorry. I have on my list of notes terms for multiracial people that are offensive and dated. Now, we're not going to read them all. No, because there are so many of them. We're not going to read them all. Um, but I will put them on the blog because they are really interesting. They're from a, um, a resource to help teach students uh, about race. Um, and there is one big aspect, which is sort of the multiracial identity. Um, just for the record, don't say mulatto. I hear that a lot. Mm -hmm. um, don't say half and half or half breed. Um, don't even say half black or half white because, you know, I'm not a fraction. It reminds me of that. There was this Star Trek original series episode where they met these people that were half, like, they were literally painted yeah. half black and <laughs> half white, which is a very 60s way of trying to... <laughs> Deal with that. <laughs> Trying to look at multiracial people. But that's exactly what I think about, so don't do that. Yeah. I don't like brownie. I don't like dusky. When you when you, you when you were describing things it's like and for for the for the love of all things good, don't describe people in terms of food. Oh, don't do that. <laughs> and um don't use mixed blood. Cause we're smarter now. We know we know science, mm -hmm. and that's just a stupid way <laughs> yeah. of referring to somebody's race. Um, but there are terms that you can use. You can use "I like multiracial." Sometimes I get caught saying "biracial," which isn't really a true descriptor of me. Like I should be using multiracial, but mm -hmm. sometimes I use biracial. But multiracial or multi heritage. Or mixed heritage. I guess you could say mixed race, but I don't even really like that one. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's kind of that's getting on the the more older side of things. I think. Yeah. So I'm not into that. But um, yeah. So that's what I would do. I would just and if you see people with multiracial kids, don't don't feel the need to comment on it and dissect their genetic origin. It doesn't really matter. Yeah, I mean, the fact of the matter is, is those kids, 
don't really care no. because they're kids and they're trying to just be kids. Yeah, so. And don't put your silliness onto them. Yeah, so don't do that. So. But, yeah, I think that's pretty good. I think this is a good precursor for the next episode. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So... Uh, Shall any I? Any conclusions? Well, I I thought this was funny when I was when I was doing some of the sort of background reading for this episode. I came came across something interesting, and this is this. So, the most significant genetic distinction is not between these artificial distinctions of race, like white, black, or whatever, but actually between human and Neanderthal. So, explain. Yeah, this is interesting. Europeans. Have one to two percent Neanderthal DNA, or sorry, Neanderthal DNA on average. Some people has have as high as four percent, which doesn't sound like a lot, but because everybody carries different parts of all this, it's actually, you know, when you tally up all the people, all the European folks or people of European descent, it's about twenty percent of the entire Neanderthal genome is still running around on the planet, and. So, for example, if you've ever seen a redhead or a prominent brow, chances are you got some Neanderthal in you. Do, do you? Oh, I'm sure I do. I'm positive <laughs> I do. You were very quick. To, yeah. Yeah, I do. So that's, you know, that's way more significant, g- genetically significant than the markers for racial differences. Yeah. And... The fact that that is just now becoming part of a, an, an academic conversation. Nobody really talks about this or even, you know, it's not news. Yeah. But the fact of the matter is, it's like that's way bigger than any of the other stuff we're dealing with. And yet, for some reason, it's not the issue. Yeah. You know, so some of us are sort of part pre-human. Uh, I don't like the uh, proto-human. Proto-human. Like in Prometheus. <laughs> Proto-human. We are the goo. (laughs) That probably wasn't smart. So it's just dangerous to ascribe to racial purity. It's dumb. Doesn't exist. Not existing. So we're all multiracial. Embrace it. Or suck it up. No, don't suck it up. Embrace it. I'm talking about my... my... Neanderthal thing? Yeah. (laughs) Well, there's probably some good points to it. Thicker skulls? Yeah, see? (laughs) That's why rugby players probably don't wear helmets. Is that not a good conclusion to make? (laughs) Wear a helmet. (laughs) Change your rules. Wear a helmet. Oh, no, don't. So, thanks for the chat. Cool. Yeah. Just because the podcast is over doesn't mean the conversation has to stop. We would love to hear your comments, reflections, and questions. Visit us at our blog, imcpodcast.blogspot.com, or tweet to us at imcpodcast. If you're a Facebook user, we have a page there too, at facebook.com slash imcpodcast. New episodes upload every Sunday. Our theme song is called Righteous Fight by Angara. Thanks for listening. See you next week. <laughs>